Welcome, uh, welcome to my shack. This is uh, Annie the Heath Kitty, and I'm sure Louie the other Heath Kitty will show up at some point. Uh, but uh, I've got a, a presentation here on oscilloscopes in the shack, and it's not about how to use an oscilloscope. It's more about the different types of scopes and uh, how they're important to ham radio operators and uh, how your station is operating. Uh, so with uh, any further ado, we'll get over and uh, share a screen here and get the program underway. Let's see, screen two. And there we go. Uh, this will last about 30 minutes, and I'll be around for as long as you want for uh, questions. Hi, everybody, and welcome to uh, this presentation from the Test Equipment Series on Oscilloscopes. So what's in the presentation? Well, it's intended as an introduction to oscilloscopes and some of the uses and the benefits to the amateur radio operator. Not included are specifics on how a scope works nor how to use the instrument for troubleshooting. Uh, what you're gonna learn on this presentation is uh, an introduction to scopes. And uh, this could take a full college semester if we went into it fully, so that's not what we're here about. All right, what we're going to learn is also the value of what a scope brings to learning electronics and the value it brings into the ham shack. Uh, we'll show you a lot of different things on this presentation, uh, what can be measured, uh, the different types of scopes and the features, uh, the differences between analog and digital scopes. Uh, we'll have some examples of some waveforms and examples of uh, instruments uh, to make uh, measurements on a scope. We'll also have a little demonstration, if there's time, on uh, measuring capacitance and inductance, and also how to measure the length and impedance of a coaxial cable. So what is a scope? Well, according to uh, Webster's uh, device for viewing oscillations uh, as electrical voltage or current and displayed on the screen of a cathode ray tube, that's a bit dated. Scopes are a bit more than that these days. So we'll update it to uh, Paul's definition here, a device for viewing the amplitude of electrical signals over a period of time or frequency or magnitude of current on a screen of a cathode ray tube, liquid crystal display, or a computer screen. Uh, what can you measure with this scope? Well, quite a bit, actually. Of course, voltage, current, impedance, capacitance, inductance, velocity factor, phase angle, resistance, power, uh, carrier modulation, frequency, rise and fall time of various signals. Right, you can uh, view and decode uh, digital signals. Uh, you can measure pressure transducers and for many applications in the medical industry, such as monitoring blood pressure, EKG, EEG, and radiology, and so forth. Uh, so what can you measure with an oscilloscope in the frequency domain? That would be filter characteristics, response curves, SWR bandwidth, deviation, power bandwidth, IF alignment and bandwidth, uh, receiver oscillator alignment if you're aligning a radio. Okay, we can also, also use a scope in XY mode, which will give us the ability to measure frequency radio, passive component characteristics, uh, characteristics of active components, diodes, transistors, and so forth. You can also use, use it as a ready tuning indicator in your shack and you can measure RF amplifier linearity and modulation. In the scope technologies, the first scope and the oldest scope is their current sweep. They're good as a waveform monitor. You can do some XY with them. Uh, they're not calibrated, so it's hard to measure exact voltages and uh, exact frequencies. They're old tech, no longer manufactured, and they are a little difficult to use because you can't sync the waveform easily. So scope technologies continued. We have calibrated and triggered sweep scopes. Of course, they can be used as a waveform monitor. You can still use them in XY mode, but they're calibrated for amplitude and sweep. So you can actually measure voltage and you can actually measure uh, time. And inversely, you can also measure frequency. All current scopes are of this type. Now, currently, there's tr calibrated scopes with triggered sweep. You can still use them for monitors. They do XY modes. They're calibrated for voltage and amplitude so that you can actually measure the voltage accurately. And they're also calibrated for sweep time, so you can get uh, exact uh, delay times and uh, period times on the scope, as well as the inverse of that, the frequency of the signals you're looking at. 
Uh, all current scopes are of this type, and uh, they all contain trigger circuits which provide for stable displays. There's also digital and analog storage or multi-domain scopes. In the analog realm, again, you can use them for waveform monitors. Uh, they use a CRT for display. Continuing on in architecture, there are analog and digital scopes and multi-domain scopes. In the analog realm, uh, you can uh, measure them, measure your uh, waveforms, of course, and uh, your CRT displays are used. They're best for rapidly changing waveforms, such as uh, monitoring your audio or RF envelopes. Uh, High-end scopes can have cursors and math functions. More about that later. Uh, they're readily available on the used market for very low prices, often free. Uh, new analog scopes are more expensive than entry-level digital scopes. Right? In the digital storage scope category, they can be used as a waveform monitors, but uh, gives you more precision. Uh, used as an LCD display instead of a CRT. Uh, you can also display them on your computer. Uh, they're best for digital signals and recurring analog signals. Entry-level uh, scopes have advanced features such as cursors, uh, measurement readouts, and math functions. Uh, Multi-domain scopes also provide a logic analyzer and or spectrum analyzer functions to the scope. So what do you buy, analog or digital? Well, really should think about getting both. With your analog scopes, they're easier to learn. Uh, they're better for monitoring RF envelopes in the shack and other analog signals. And digital scopes bring a phenomenal spectrum of measurement capabilities that are far more complex with a steeper learning curve. Regardless of what technology you go for, get as much bandwidth as you can possibly afford. In scope grades, uh, we generally have uh, two grades, service grade and laboratory grade. The service grade, such as this uh, leader, a 20 megahertz dual trace scope, it is solid state with the exception of the CRT. Uh, makes a good general monitor scope, and uh, again, being triggered and uh, calibrated, you uh, you have a very good scope that's great for a shack. Uh, size isn't too awful big, but it is a substantial piece of equipment. In the laboratory grade, you have uh, Tektronix and uh, Keysight, LaCroix, uh, and others that are in that laboratory grade, but they're very expensive. Uh, on the screen here, you see the uh, Tektronix 11302A. It's a 500 megahertz analog scope with digital capabilities. It can store its waveforms, and it can give you a digital readout uh, with cursors, uh, so it helps with the measurements. This is a uh, recurrent sweep scope, and uh, that particular type of oscilloscope, again, is, is okay for monitoring. Uh, they don't have particularly strong bandwidth, uh, but they're they're pretty decent scopes altogether. Uh, and but you really want to try to avoid these if you can. Uh, here's another Heath kit, the IO4510, and this is the kind of scope that you want to get between that leader that you saw earlier and the Heath kit. If you're going to get an analog scope, this is about the style that you're looking for. Uh, this one is 15 megahertz. Uh, if you're really going to start out, you should be up into 30 to 50 megahertz if you can find them. But they're dirt cheap, sometimes free. This was a $20 uh, find at uh, Hamfest, and I also found the uh, leader at uh, Rietta Ranch. It's a general flea market, and sometimes people show up with interesting stuff and, and was able to pick up that scope for $20. So they're not real expensive. Uh, with the analog scopes. You'll see them on eBay with high, prices that are way too high. You throw in the shipping on top of it, forget it. I wouldn't buy any recurring sweep off of uh, eBay. Currently, the uh, digital scope realm, you'll find that uh, the Chinese uh, folks have done some pretty tremendous jobs getting the cost of scopes down. Uh, here's a Rigel digital scope. It's 70, 70 megahertz dual channel. Uh, I only have one channel displayed here in the yellow line in the center, and you've got horizontal uh, cursors for measuring the amplitude and vertical cursors for measuring time, and uh, those results are displayed in the little square you see in the upper left-hand corner of the display.
Also, there's lots of USB scopes out there. These plug directly into the USB port of your computer or tablet. And uh, you have software that will display a waveform on the screen. Uh, these are not bad. They're not my first choice for an oscilloscope, but you can get some pretty sophisticated ones. Uh, but this is just one that I have on hand for demo purposes and for teaching. Uh, they're not bad little scopes, but uh, there's nothing like a real uh, separate scope interest, uh, instrument on your desk. And if you want to try out a scope and don't want to spend a whole bunch of money, here's a, a little digital scope, a DSO-138. Get these off of Amazon and eBay for 20 to $30, uh, depending on whether you want the plastic case or not. They come as a kit and with through-hole parts. Uh, there's no SMT soldering to be done. And you put the, put the thing together in a couple of hours, and you got yourself a working digital oscilloscope to learn with. A little bit of a pain to use, but they're not bad. Uh, they only got about 100 kilohertz of bandwidth, but it's a nice device to learn on. And if you like kit building, they're a whole bunch of fun. There are some specialty scopes out there. For example, the Heathkit SB614 station monitor. Uh, these are real handy in the shack. They're re relatively easily priced on eBay, but they are slightly on the expensive side because they're a dedicated instrument. This is a spectrum analyzer from Signalant. You're looking at the RF display of 1340 kilohertz AM, our local AM station. And there's a ton of functions built into this that uh, older spectrum analyzers don't have. Uh, this particular one with the uh, tracking generator option uh, was 1600 bucks. So you look at that, that's not a real expensive piece of kit, and you'll see later why. And specialty scopes again, uh, what you're looking at is a uh, 7603 mainframe scope from the 70s and 80s from Tektronix. That uh, scope itself, we're talking about the part with the CRT display, was about 3600 bucks. Um, so they're, they're, the mainframe is what you got, and then you had to put plugins in it to make it do what you want. In this particular case, it's a 16-channel uh, logic analyzer. It would actually display 16 different waveforms on that screen. Continuing on, the 7633 on the left, that's an analog storage scope. Uh, it actually stores the uh, waveform on the screen, and you would use a camera to take a picture of it. That mainframe was about $4,600. Uh, in there is a uh, dual-channel vertical amplifier, the module on the left. The center module is a differential amplifier, and then, of course, you've got your horizontal control module on the right. On the right-hand scope, another 7603, there's a... Uh, 7L14 spectrum analyzer plug-in, and uh, these things were pretty expensive. The plug-in in 1975 was $18,000, so as you can see, that would be quite an expensive oscilloscope. Uh, other types of instruments uh, that fall into specialty is a curve tracer. This is a Tektronix 576, and it's designed to display the characteristics of components, particularly uh, transistors and other solid state components. Back in 75, it was 20 grand. That's 100 grand today. So they're very expensive uh, instruments for sure. Right, and that would be a display on the 576 of a family of curves for a transistor. The nice thing about the curve tracer, the transistor curve tracer, is that it tests the transistor under real operating conditions, not low voltage like an analog meter model would do. Uh, back in the days of uh, home, uh, home electronics service shops in your neighborhood, your mom and pop TV store, uh, they couldn't afford the $20,000 for a Tektronix curve tracer, but they could afford two ninety five dollars or about $1,500 in these days for an add-on. That's a, a liter scope with a, a liter curve tracer outside unit. Hook it up to the horizontal and vertical inputs of the scope and display the curves. You can see on this one, there's only six curves that it displays, whereas on the Tektronix, it was 10. So these weren't nearly as comprehensive, but look at the price difference for sure. All right, other specialty co uh, scopes are uh, component curve tracers, and this particular one is a Huntron. And uh, you can display capacitors and resistors, 
inductors and uh, solid state devices, but you can only do two terminals. So you would have to display the response of a terminal from uh, emitter to base, for example, and base to collector uh, on the screen with a separate measurement, and then, then you could test your transistor that way. So uh, they were interesting instruments, but they were still rather expensive. I mean, for example, you could get a Heath kit uh, for about uh, 250 bucks. That would be $2,500 in, in terms these days. That previous Heath kit that we saw, the dual trace trigger that was almost $600. Multiply that by five, and it was still a $3,000 scope. So you can see that these days the price of equipment has gone down dramatically. The real sad thing about uh, the Huntron and that Heath kit uh, curve tracer is that they were stripped down oscilloscopes with uh, just a power supply in it to do the measuring. So you could uh, actually use your regular plain Jane oscilloscope with this circuit and do exactly what the Huntron and the Heath kit did. Uh, so uh, why they're still commanding such huge, huge prices on eBay is beyond me. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, here you go. This is all you need to make, uh, make a curve tracer out of your regular oscilloscope. In order to use an oscilloscope, you have to have some sort of input signal from someplace, either through your circuit that you're working on, say an audio circuit that you're tracing out, or perhaps an uh, RF envelope out of your transmitter, what have you. But if you're working with uh, components or testing components or non-powered circuits, you have to have some sort of uh, signal coming in. And for that, you can use an uh, AF generator or RF generator, DC power supply, a pulse generator, uh, a transformer, or other type of uh, source so that you can get your, uh, uh, your signal into your uh, components. So here we have some examples of signal sources. At the top is a function generator uh, that'll do sine, square, triangle, waves up to 2 megahertz. A uh, handy little instrument, but it's kind of on the old tech side. Uh, this one I got at um, Nearfest for 20 bucks. Uh, in the center is a fast edge pulse generator kit, and uh, uh, Alan, W2AEW, uh, uses that to test his stuff. And you'll learn more about Alan in the, in the uh, presentation here as well. At the bottom is an arbitrary function generator, which is the uh, digital modern equivalent to the function generator at the top. And uh, that can uh, produce a wide variety of waveforms. And you can even capture waveforms on your oscilloscope, export them to this device, and this device will reproduce those waveforms for further testing and analysis. So a uh, great piece of kit to have, but they are a little on the expensive side. Uh, this one was just under $300 for a 25 megahertz uh, generator. So how do you measure components like capacitors, inductors, and others? Well, there's some really great videos on YouTube on how to do all that stuff, but about the best out there is Alan, W2AEW. Uh, he's the uh, tech specialist, as a matter of fact, tech specialist coordinator down in uh, southern New Jersey. And Alan is the scope guru of all time, my hero. Uh, his ability to uh, work a scope and do magic with him is, is beyond belief. You really need to look him up on YouTube if you're interested in oscilloscopes. It's, uh, you know, he's great lessons. So look for number 90 on his uh, list of uh, YouTube videos on how to measure capacitors and inductors. Uh, we can also measure uh, coax, and Alan has a video up on that, number 37, using that pulse generator we saw earlier. And a little bit of math, you can actually determine how long a piece of coax is, and very, very accurately, depending on your oscilloscope. If your oscilloscope is accurate, then your measurements will become accurate. This comes in really handy if you're trying to create uh, phasing harnesses and so forth. Uh, you know, it's a great, great, great tool to have. So about scopes in the shack, I mean, that's why we're all here, is what can, uh, what can we benefit or how can we benefit from scopes in the shack? Uh, well, first off, uh, uh, current or recurrent sweep or trigger sweep scopes are okay, but the analog scopes are the best. Right? So whether you get a, a recurrent or triggered sweep, analog scope is the one that you want to start with for the shack. All right, and what you can use it for uh, is to monitor your on-air signal for proper modulation, uh, uh, verify the accuracy of your watt meter. Uh, you can test your, uh, or it's best for your tuning indicator for your uh, ready signal. Uh, that's receiving signals, that is. 
you can monitor the linearity of your amplifier and uh, other digital uses such as the FFT, uh, Fast Fourier Transform Math Function, which will turn your plain Jane digital storage oscilloscope into a rudimentary spectrum analyzer. So if you suspect that a good portion of your energy is getting out in harmonics, you'd actually be able to use your oscilloscope to see that by using the FFT function. And uh, Fast Fourier Transform is only one of the many mathematical functions that most scopes can perform. The SB614 is installed in my check, so we've got some examples here of what to look for. Right, here's good modulation. You can see that uh, the tops of the waveforms at the peaks are, are rounded. They're not cut off, so I've got good modulation here, good clear signal. Overmodulating, you start to uh, outpace what your power supply can handle in your uh, transmitter. And you'll notice that on the peaks of those signals, they're all squared off at the top. That introduces an awful lot of extra bandwidth to your signal. It introduces a lot of interference on the band. And so having this uh, scope in your shack uh, is a really good idea. Your ALC meter is OK, but this is the real McCoy. This is really looking at your transmitted signal. And uh, you can see uh, just how clear it is. You can't hear your signal because you're transmitting, obviously. Others can hear it, and they can comment on it. But being able to see your signal as you're transmitting gives you a real good idea of just how good you sound. Right. The other function of this particular device is to uh, measure the linearity of your signal. What happens here is that uh, on the X mode, or the vertical mode of the, of the scope, you have your uh, amplifier output that's giving you the vertical signal. The horizontal signal, uh, making it go from left to right, is actually your input. In other words, your transmitters, your transceiver's output goes in and makes the scope go horizontally. And if you get a nice trapezoid like this with nice flat edges, then you know you've got linearity. And if the signal goes out to a nice sharp point, you've got 100% modulation as well. So uh, this is very, very important if you've got an amplifier in the shack and a very good way to, to make sure that you're able to uh, get a nice clean signal out. Here we're a little under modulated and you can see the point of the uh, trapezoid is cut off. So we're under modulated here. And here's where we started to get into real trouble. We've got too much modulation, too much drive, and we're starting to go nonlinear. Uh, you can see the edges of the trapezoid uh, are starting to bulge out. And that front point, even though it's going out fully, the whole envelope is starting to shorten up on you. Uh, so this is, uh, this is nonlinear, overmodulated, and it's very easy to see on the scope. And you can see what's happening. The only other way to see what's actually going on is to look at your spectrum on a spectrum uh, spectrum analyzer. Uh, but that's a whole different level of expense for your shack. These things are great little monitors. The, every ham manufacturer makes one. Kenwood Yezu ICOM. Uh, and, of course, these Heath kits. And these Heath kits are very plentiful out there. They're usually in the $100 range or so if you can find them. So I hopefully I've convinced you that having a scope in a shack is important. But if you're new to scopes, and you're best off getting an analog to learn on. You can still get them out there. Uh, they're not real expensive. Often you can get them for free and get as much bandwidth as you can afford. If you're purchasing an analog scope, make sure that it's working. Get a dual trace. Get triggered sweep. Make sure it's solid state. But, of course, the CRT isn't, but that's okay. Right. Get as much bandwidth as you can get for your budget. Uh, you want to be in the 25 to 30 megahertz minimum, but if you can get a 50 megahertz or greater, that's even better. Right. As the functionality will increase at those 50 megahertz scopes and up. Uh, if, most of all, though, get, uh, get some guidance from your Elmer on purchasing a scope. Uh, if you're going out to a ham fest, which is not a bad place to buy them, up at Nearer Fest, you'll often see them uh, on tables operating for, so that the seller lets you know that it's an operating scope. Um, you know, for, for a monitor scope in a ham shack, usually the service grade scopes are, are just fine. 
Um, you get into the high-end scopes like the Tex and the Agilence and HPs and so forth. Uh, if you get a problem with those, they're kind of a pain to uh, uh, to fix and get running again, uh, as opposed to something like a Heath kit that uses standardized parts. They're easy to keep going. All right, if you're going to get into the digital realm, uh, remember you've got a much steeper learning curve to get there, but the scopes are pretty inexpensive. You need a new scope in a $250 class, and we'll have a couple examples here so shortly. Right, they're great when you're designing and experimenting, especially in the digital realm. They bring a tremendous amount of functionality that even the most advanced lab-grade scopes of the 70s, 80s, and, and even the 90s couldn't approach. The most impressive function is the math. Right? You see the formula up in the right-hand corner, W equals V squared divided by 50 ohms. You can actually use your oscilloscope, your digital oscilloscope, to measure the voltage that's coming out of your transmitter and then doing some mathematical work. You put this formula right into the scope, and a second waveform will appear on your screen. And that waveform will be actually calibrated in the watts that you're putting out. So it's a, it's a really cool way of, uh, of monitoring your output in that, on that digital scope. Uh, the, uh, the other things that you can do, for example, uh, displaying voltage and current on two different waveforms, and then have a third waveform that tells you what the resistance is of the circuit. Uh, so it's really interesting what you can do with the digital scopes these days. They're really, really powerful. All right. uh, brand names are always safe, but the Asian producers are quite capable. Uh, probably two of the best Asian are Siglent and Rigol, uh, and they're very ham-friendly prices. There's another one out there, O1. They're usually the bargain basement brand. Not bad stuff, but you're starting to get into uh, construction quality issues, that kind of thing with the lower price scopes. But remember, get as much bandwidth as you can afford. Here's an example of a Tektronix scope. The Tektronix is, uh, you know, laboratory grade. This is 60 megahertz, and it's about 1,300 bucks. Uh, specs aren't aren't too bad, but they're not calling out how many waveforms per second that it will do. Conversely, uh, the Rigol scopes are really really good scopes. Uh, this is a 50 megahertz. It's about uh, $350, but it's four channels, just like the tech. Uh, it's a little bit less in bandwidth, uh, but a very capable scope. And uh, I'm sure you'd uh, be proud to own this guy. Uh, they do work really nice. But that's not all. The 1104 from Rigol is 100 megahertz bandwidth, four channels, plus 16 channels of uh, digital. Uh, so you can uh, do that uh, logic waveform analysis. All right, and it's about 500 bucks. And if you want to throw in a two-channel 25 megahertz arbitrary function generators like the one you saw, uh, that 499 becomes 639. So you get two instruments for $639. I mean, there's quite a bit of stuff that you're getting in that package for real short money. Uh, want to learn more? Paul Danzer, K1II, puts out a really nice uh, oscilloscope book from the ARRL. Uh, you can uh, certainly get a hold of that. Some of my favorite YouTubers, as we mentioned, was Alan Wolke, W2AEW. And uh, you've got Mr. Carlson's lab, VE7, ZWZ. Paul Carlson's got a really, really great YouTube channel all about techie stuff. Not a lot on the ham radio front, a few items up there, but it's mostly about uh, refurbishing uh, old equipment and test equipment use and how to use them. Great YouTube channel. Finally, one of the most prolific electrical engineering uh, uh, channels out there is the EEV blog from David L. Jones. Unfortunately, Dave's not a ham radio operator, but that's okay. We can forgive him for that. He's just a crazy Aussie who does really, really great videos on all kinds of test equipment, not just scopes. There's a bunch more out there, too, but uh, watch YouTube and uh, learn a little bit. If you haven't gotten a scope yet, do a little bit of research here, and I think uh, it'll go a long, long way for you to uh, get the scope that you really need and spend money only once. 
All right, we'll have a little bit of a Q&A session, and uh, we'll see what happens with that. So in the meantime, before we're... Thank you very much for watching the presentation. I certainly hope uh, that you've learned something new, and uh, we'll be around for the uh, Q&A. Uh, you can get me uh, with this information here. Uh, I'm good at uh, awrl.net, so W1SCX at awrl.net, and I've also got my bio up on qrz.com. Just look me up there. There's a bunch of really good information on test equipment and other ham radio adventures. So thank you very much for uh, viewing the presentation, and uh, let's go to your questions. Thank you, Paul. All right, there you go. Hope you all enjoyed it. They do have a couple additional notes um, on those links that were in the presentation. If you go to my QRZ page, they'll be in there at the bottom and uh, you can get to those other links. Uh, a couple of notes, uh, particularly from Alan W2AEW. Uh, in one of his videos, he indicates uh, that you really want to be careful when you're trying to sample coming out of your transmitter. Uh, for example, uh, uh, you don't want to hook your scope directly to uh, to your output, uh, but there's a number of ways that you can get samples. If you're using a tuner, uh, you can usually, and you're not using all the ports, there's enough wiring running around inside. You can hook your scope to one of the unused ports. Just remember, don't transmit to it. Uh, otherwise, you uh, may damage the scope depending on how much power you're putting out. Uh, if you do want to sample directly out of your scope, uh, there's a number of different ways of doing it. Uh, there are uh, sampling devices out there, such as this one. Uh, you get a you get an input and an output, and all it is is a straight through. And there's a uh, little uh, sampler here. There's a BNC connector on there, and all it is is a little loop of wire on it uh, that will pick up on the uh, conductor in the middle here. And then you can adjust this in and out as needed uh, to get the sensitivity. But that gets you a sample uh, that you can look at. If you're more interested in getting something that's actually calibrated so that you can use that math function on your digital scope, uh, what you'll want to do is make yourself a, uh, uh, an adapter or, if you will, a probe. Um, here I have a UHF connector which you would hook this part to your uh, uh, transceiver. And on one end, you'd hook your antenna. And then on the other side, you can build yourself a probe. Now, oscilloscopes usually come with uh, a standard 10 to 1 probe that gives you a 10x attenuation of the signal coming in. So if you look up the schematic for a 10x oscilloscope probe, Get yourself a little box and you can build in the uh, uh, build into the little box the same circuit that's in your 10 to 1 probe and then this would go off to your uh, oscilloscope this would go out to your antenna now you've got direct sampling of what's coming out of your scope and it is calibrated right I even built into this one the little compensating uh, uh, capacitor uh, so that you get an accurate uh, accurate reading out of it uh, you can also sample uh, your audio. Uh, this particular device is for uh, uh, sampling the, uh, yeah, we got it right, is for sampling and, and uh, detecting the audio on your AM signal. So uh, lots of different devices that you can need. Once you get an oscilloscope, you'll find yourself collecting adapters of all kinds so that you can uh, get different stuff hooked in and out of your test gear. Uh, also with scopes, you can measure current with them. You can either measure the voltage drop off of a one ohm resistor. Uh, there are different probes out here. This is a Hantec 65, uh, 65 amp uh, clamp on probe. And these things use the, the Hall effect and will measure AC and DC current. Uh, pretty handy little devices. Uh, if you've ever, you hear it all the time, well, you're current leads in a capacitive circuit and then in a voltage leads in an inductive circuit. I'm not sure, how can you see that? How can you see that? There you go. So any uh, questions, uh, go ahead. Yeah, um, can you hear me? Yep, go right ahead. Okay, uh, I, I was trying to buy a scope a few weeks ago and I'm on AliExpress, which is my favorite Chinese website. 
and they had a bunch of regal scopes. But there's all these different models, and those Chinese web pages are, are not set up for you to compare features. You don't always. Oh, I lost well, your image. Yeah, uh, you, could, you could go. You could go directly to the to the Regal site, do your comparison there, then pick your model number and go over to AliExpress and order it up. You know that's a good idea. You didn't think of that. I will do that. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm going to just show you. Uh, that's my little. Uh, whoop! There it is. That's yeah. my little network analyzer. There you go. It it, uh, it operates via Bluetooth with my uh, cell phone. Oh wow, that's that's cool. How much was that? Uh, you don't want to ask. It was way way too much. Okay, all right, we won't. I ask. bought this about five years ago, and it was when they were just coming out with them, and I paid almost five hundred bucks for it. Ooh. Yeah, so 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 these days, if you want a good buy on a similar device, the Nano VNA is the thing to get, and there it's a uh, ten kilohertz to nine hundred megahertz. A nano VNA, and they can be had for uh, fifty bucks. Yeah, this I think that's the same manufacturer as this one. I'm not sure. No, it's different. Yeah, okay. I've I've got that one as well, Bill. Okay. Oh, um, this is Jim. Uh, encourage you know our uh, field service guys that are on the line to ask any questions they need. But typically in the field, what we use is one of these. It's a uh, Let's see, get closer. It's a Fluke 190-504. It's a 500 megahertz bandwidth, four channel scope. Fairly rugged, and I never leave home without it. <laughs> if it works, it's a Fluke. Yep. Hey, hey Jim, are the uh, inputs on that isolated? They are. They are all isolated from each other. Yeah, one of the, one of the things you gotta be careful of with your oscilloscope, uh, if you have a circuit that is not common to ground. Uh, let's say, for example, you've got a, a common collector uh, transistor, and you want to measure the uh, bias voltage uh, on the um, on the uh, base to emitter, and you try to do that with your oscilloscope. All of a sudden, one of those transistor ports are going to be at ground level, and it's not going to work out well. Yeah, yeah. There's some parts of our uh, equipment that actually have a reference ground that's 200 volts above chassis, uh, 200 volts DC. So we... Uh... Yeah, good good thing to have that. And that's yep. what I mentioned earlier with the Tektronic scope, it had a, uh, a differential uh, amplifier on it. And that's exactly what that's for. It's got two inputs. It's only a single trace, but it's got two inputs. So you'd put one, pro one probe across one uh, terminal on the transistor and the other one uh, there and they and they don't go to ground. They don't see ground. The only thing ground is used for is shielding. Anybody else? How many we got on the channel so far? Um, we have 42 right now. We had a peak of 48. Um, my guys, ask questions. Now's your chance. Hey, Paul, Paul, I've got, got a, a, an old, go ahead. I have a quick one for you. Isn't, yeah, go ahead, Bill. This is an analog storage is that kind of an oxymoron? Don't they have to digitize the, the signal to store it? No, actually, uh, uh, Tektronix came out with the uh, storage scope uh, in the 60s. And what it is, is they, they will flood the screen uh, with, a, uh, with a, a flood of electrons. And it's not, they're not enough velocity to, uh, uh, to make the screen illuminate. But the minute that you hit it with a with a full blast of a, a full sweep with a regular uh, electron gun, uh, that image will have a tendency to stay illuminated because of that of those electrons flooding the screen, mm -hmm. and it gives you it gives you a period of time where you can uh, take a picture mm -hmm. of that with a camera. Um, I've got some examples of uh, those. Uh, scopes that I saw when I was in Vegas here a few weeks ago. Uh, they've got a museum down there, the uh, National uh, Nuclear Testing Site Museum, and they actually have a rack of Tektronix scopes. Uh, what are they, 7703s in, uh, in rack format, all with their cameras attached and the, and the whole get up all wired together to measure all kinds of different stuff. Uh, that happens instantly. 
uh, you know, for very short durations. And then the cat, the, the, tr the scopes will trigger, uh, the cameras sense the trigger, the open the shutter, and uh, you get that image uh, onto those cameras. So a storage scope is a real honest to goodness thing. And they did it with flooding electrons on the screen. So it was still all analog. Did I answer your question? Yes. Paul, I've got an old late 50s, early 60s, dual channel tectronic scope. I get a hernia every time I try to lift it up. Uh, is it worth trying to resurrect it? Um, you know, if it's, if, it, if it's not working, when you look at the expense that you might have to go through, uh, you know, I'd be putting my money into something more modern. Uh, but that's just me. I mean, it depends on, on how attached you are to it. I mean, there's certainly great scopes. Uh, I've got a 1964 uh, vintage 453 portable scope uh, that was originally designed for IBM. And uh, that thing still operates today. I still trust my life to it. Uh, you know, the, these things just don't have a tendency to die. But at some point, they all eventually will. Uh, the, uh, maybe, maybe it's just uh, capacitors. Maybe it's more than that. You'd, you'd have to take a look at it. Hey, Dick, I've got two of those in my basement. I've got a, a Tektronix 535 and a 545. So. Yeah, <laughs> those, and it's in the basement, are, right? Those are very nice scopes. My first, oscill my first oscilloscope, which I still have in the other room, is uh, Tektronix 468. And that's a completely analog scope but it had like a digital add-on you know so there's almost like a little bubble top on it yeah so you, can... you can use it analog no problem flip hit the button it's in digital mode and you get cursors and yeah. it's yeah, um, you can you can look at waveforms and uh, heat the shack at the same time they had like 40 <laughs> tubes in it that's true i don't think this one has any tubes in it actually the... except for the crt the 545 for the bandwidth was an excellent scope. It has a, a very fast phosphor on it, uh, despite the fact that it's a foot heater. Uh, if you were gonna, if you had one that was working, it'll easily rival anything that was shown in the lower end category today. Yep. Yep. Oh, uh, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, I got one of these uh, hand tech. Uh, and it's, I, I just got it, and it's a 250 megahertz uh, bandwidth, and uh, it's it's four it's got four channels. Yeah. And Banggood sold it for a hundred bucks. Oh no, kidding! That's that's a great price. I've got and, uh, uh, I've got mine going here, and uh, uh, you know these these aren't too bad. I got it upside down, but uh, yeah, they're they're not too bad. Uh, this is the, this is a cheap one that I just bought for a demo. It was sixty bucks. If I'd have found that one uh, for for a hundred, I'd have bought that instead. Yeah, two hundred. Um, then I got this. Uh, this one's a kind of nice scope. I, <laughs> I actually use it a lot. It's a Aten. Yeah. And it's a hundred megahertz um, and two channel. And uh, I use it for uh, troubleshooting a lot of digital circuits with it. Yeah. The, 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 the digital scopes are just mind blowing on how they can uh, yeah. troubleshoot with those digital circuits. The only thing it couldn't do was a curve tracer on the X and Y. It, it just doesn't work. Oh, really? Yeah. What, what do you have for curve tracer? It's a, a BNK. Okay. I got the model number. Yep. I know which one. But on analog scope, it works great. But on this thing here, it's, it gets choppy. The caution, a lot of the lower end Chinese scopes have very poor accuracy time bases and very limited dynamic range. Uh, it's just something to look out for. Yeah, I mean, you know, you get what you pay for. I don't care what it is. Mm -hmm. but, the, but nowadays, compared to years ago, you're getting a lot more than you ever got before. But I got uh, three different uh, Tektronix scopes. When Polaroid went out of business, uh, I worked for Polaroid. And uh, they called me up out of the blue after I already left Polaroid and said, yeah, we're getting rid of all the equipment we have in our calibration lab. So I went down there and I loaded the 
I had a uh, Toyota Corolla, a tiny one, and I, I couldn't put more stuff in it. <laughs> so I got all my electronic scopes and some of the equipment to calibrate them. So I got really lucky. So I get a phone call one day from uh, a teacher over at uh, one of the Votech schools. And he says, were you interested in some electronics gear? And I says, well, yeah. <laughs> says, well, good. Put a letter together. Let them know what you're going to be doing with it. And uh, come on down. And I said, okay. So I went down there and uh, uh, they said, it's, it's a fair amount of stuff. You know, I said, okay. So I took the seats out of the minivan and filled it. Um, <laughs> That 576 was just one of the items. Uh, it, you know, I got the scope mobiles to go along with them too. So I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I've got now 17 oscilloscopes. Wow. <laughs> I have a tube we'll one. Send heard sooner or later. I have a vacuum tube uh, tectronic scope. I do want to get rid of it. I, I'm going to downsize, and so I don't want it. If somebody wants it. Uh, about 20 years ago, I used it, and it did work. But it hasn't been used since. So uh, let It'll me know if anybody wants it. Last time I plugged it in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where have, you, where have we heard that before? <laughs> about uh, about ten thousand years ago, um, I was the foreman of a tectronics repair center in England. It was inside another company that I was a field service engineer for, and I was only nineteen years old. And I was making about five pounds a week more than any of the people working in there. But I remember it fondly, 517s, and I've forgotten what the next one up was, but we also had the tele-equipment scopes. And um, being leery of high voltage, I always told people, you know, uh, one hand behind your back, et cetera, and one day I'm walking along the line of uh, repair, you know, repairs. And if you remember, the 517 had um, lift out shelves or, or they were on pins and you could open like doors. And somebody put his head in there and he got a real belt right across the forehead and fell back <laughs> against the bench behind me. <laughs> Luckily, I um, was able to pick him up at that time. But that was um, 1960. 1963. And um, I just held up, I just bought this for $77. It's 150 megahertz digital scope. It has digital storage. Its downfall is it only has one channel. But the immediate use was troubleshooting a digital mixer at our synagogue. And um, it worked very well in low frequency area. I haven't tried it on uh, VHF or anything yet. Yeah, like I said, it's just amazing with the stuff that they're coming out with. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, when uh, when Jim put together that, that class to build those uh, DSO 138s, uh, that, that, was, that was really a great time. I do appreciate that, Jim, a whole bunch. You remember? Yeah, that? we had um, a pretty good turnout. I forget how many, like 30 people yeah. that uh, built them all. Yeah, uh, 0138 downstairs with the with a plexiglass case. Yeah, there, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a great project. You still doing those, Jim, or, or no? Well, I could probably do it again if uh, interest is uh... Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd certainly recommend it to uh, guys in our club. Was, Jim, was this a Tech Night project or another yes. project? It was a Tech Night project. Um, it's the um, single channel DSO oscilloscope. That tech night was really something, Jim. It, you know, we had so many people really wanted to do something for a change. Uh, oh, thanks. I, I have said many times in the intervening time, though, that there's probably very few of those 138s that ever got put to use other than the satisfaction of having built them. Uh, George ought to solicit articles for the newsletter, what I did with my 138. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, even though I've got this fluke scope and a tectronic scope here and I actually have another fluke handheld scope that uh, I bought used many years ago. Um, I've used that DSL scope with the little nine volt battery um, out in the back, troubleshooting something. You know, it's, 
it's it, it's just easily portable. Uh, if you're just looking for a signal and you don't really care yep. about the calibration, yeah, it's yep. great. So I want to up George. I once conducted an experiment to see if one of those little scopes would withstand a car fire, and the answer is it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I took what, what you're not telling people, Jessica, is that it caused the car fire. Well, that was not been, not able to be determined, so it's possible. <laughs> If, if anybody needs any 700 series or 7,000 series plugins, I have about 25 of them, all different time bases and verticals. Mm. And um, you can you can have them for the sake of just picking them up. Um, some just need uh, most problems with Tektronics plugin modules was the connector. And then we got this thing called the Oxit that somebody invented and it fixes it. So, uh, but um AB2IX, you can look at me up on uh, um, QRZ and uh, give me a jingle if you're looking for a particular module, you can have it. Okay. Well, I, I have, I, this is Bob Jackson. I'm, I have uh, I have a 7,000 series frame and, and I might be interested in, in what you've got. If you've got a, have you got a list? Um, not current and uh, they're out in my shed. Oh, okay. Pull them out, but I have... I have just about all of the time bases uh -huh. and I have most of the verticals except for the very low voltage ones. Okay. Very accurate. Do you, have a, differ do you have a differential module, uh, uh, vertical module? Um, I don't remember I have one. What, what kind of number would that be? Seven. Uh, I don't remember. Bob. I just, first, it, Bob, first rule of free stuff, take all of it, worry take about all of what it, it is later. And sort it out, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I might be really <laughs> interested if, if, if it but, actually no. would help me out because I'm trying to downsize. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that would be the 7A22 module. Yeah. I think okay. Yeah, I've got 24, 26s. I might have a 7A22. And I okay. Have, would have to look. Ah, uh, well, um, uh, how, where do you live? In Worcester. Oh, in Worcester. Oh, that's not a bad drive. Um, huh. Maybe I we can make a plan. I, I'm. I don't think we. I, have we actually met before. I don't know if we have. Um, I don't know. What's your call sign? Uh, Ke1jh. I I'm not on the air. <laughs> I joined the club because of all the tech stuff, and I I'm still struggling. I have my own business, so I'm busy with that and haven't gotten no, on I'm the air. Um, but. No, I've been in Samara for a number of years, but um, okay. I've, I've heard your name before. But in any case, as I said, just look up on QRZ. I'm okay. actually next door to WSU building on. Um, Wait, what's your what's your call sign? Full name, last name is Zephyr. Z E. Yeah. F F E R T. First oh, name is Adrian. Yeah. Okay. A B two I X. Okay. Yeah, I might do that because I I love that scope. I love that seven thousand seven thousand series scope. I I I really I used it a lot in graduate school, and and uh, I actually ended up getting the one from the lab yeah. in the end when they switched. It's a, so, it's a very a, good scope. It's I had a seven zero one four, and the power supply quit. Then I had a um, the rack mount, uh, one that took uh, three modules. Mm -hmm. That has a power supply problem. So, uh, I, think I have a I have one of the logic analyzer modules that I that I really wasn't meant for the four the four slot one, but I I put it in and it worked more or less. Yeah, um, yeah I think my last one went to the the um, equipment dump at Nearfest. <laughs> yeah, the um, I'll tell you the story about the uh, going down to the leagues. Uh, uh, the ham fest they had down there for the 100th uh, back in that tiny flea market area all the way across the room i spot a, a 7000 series scope on the other side of the room and um I'm, I'm thinking to myself as if i bring another one of those home my <laughs> wife is going to kill me <laughs> but you know as i was walking a little closer i started to to look and i and i saw the the plug-in and i said wait a minute and i didn't run but there was nobody getting to that scope before me. Oh, and, I, and I parked myself right in front of it. 
and yeah. it took a long time to get the guy's attention. And I says, does this thing work? And he says, well, it, the, I, I see the, the tag on it, it says lights up, but no trace. I says, does the module work? And, and he says, I don't, I don't know. And, and he pulls a box and I say, how much is it? And he pulls the box back that's on the top and it was $25. And I was thinking, you know, I'm a quarter mile away from the car. This thing's got to go 40, 45 pounds easy. I got to go up two flights of <laughs> stairs with it for $25. I'm going to schlep it. <laughs> Did it have an so analyzer get, module in it? Uh, well, I got it home. I got it home. And uh, indeed, it, it lights up, but no trace. But the module lit up. So I pulled it out. And I put in that eighteen thousand dollars spectrum analyzer module into one of the other seven thousands that are working. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The same motto that you mentioned before to somebody: if it's free, just take it, <laughs> or yeah. very low cost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I uh, used the seven thousand up until I got my uh, TDS seven fifty four. It's a very good scope. Oh yeah, no doubt. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jim, to answer your question, uh, do we use the uh, uh, the uh, the DSO 138s? Uh, I wanted to get on. I was making plans to get on the AM rally, and I had a DX40, and I needed to find a microphone. I wanted to get a D104, but you know, there's a lot of them out there, and do they work or not? So I'm thinking, geez, how can I test a mic? How can I test a mic? I says, well, I could look at it on a scope. I'm thinking, well, how do I take a portable scope? Wait a minute. So <laughs> I, 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 I pack that thing in a, in a, in a backpack and I'm thinking, well, while I'm at it, I'll take a digital multimeter with me. I've got a portable uh, uh, audio generator and I've got, you know, and next thing you know, I've got a portable lab in my backpack. So yes, that it doesn't get used for much else but it certainly gets used for uh, going to flea markets and stuff. So you've got <laughs> something to test something with. Yeah, the last um, um, little project I put together is this little thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's maybe a little bright. It's a little Nixie tube clock kit uh, yeah, that's driven neat. by an Arduino. Yeah, that's neat. It, it reminds me that um, I have a, a Hanukkah lamp set up that's made of seven pin tubes and the filaments are lighted. And a friend of mine built them, and there's a uh, bunch awesome. of toggle switches <laughs> on the front to switch in. You know, the, when you turn it on, it's, there's the middle candle, candle we call the shamus, and the first day. And then you pull the switches, and the second, the third, the fourth, and all the tube heaters light up. It gets very <laughs> hot, but it is fantastic. I wish I had a quick photo to show you. But, you can make a seven-tube yeah. receiver out of it. <laughs> and here's an, well, there's <laughs> There are bull tubes as long as they had um, uh, twelve volt uh, filaments. He, he, that's all he, he used. <laughs> Has anybody about, ever uh, heard of BNF Enterprises? You got to go back a ways, but BNF Enterprises. I think they were out of uh, Natick or Framingham. Yes. Yeah. Salem. Uh, Say, okay. All right. Well, wherever they were, they were a, a parts supplier uh, behind me. Let's see if we turn this light off a little bit. Behind me right here is their, uh, their Nixie clock that they sold kit form <laughs> way back in the 70s, early 70s, hmm. and uh, recently had the opportunity to scab onto that and bring that back to life. Uh, that was a very interesting, uh, very interesting kit. So now I've got a real Nixie clock running here too. So any, any more uh, scope questions from anybody? Don't be shy. Uh, including uh, our FSEs, ask away. No, my questions are beyond the scope. Oh, this is beyond the scope? Okay. All right. <laughs> Yeah, check, you, you know, for, for how to use bazillion and 63 uh, YouTubes out there. Uh, stick with Alan. Uh, MJ Lorton is another one. Uh, there's, just, there's just so, so many uh, really nice 
scope videos out there for uh, for learning how to use them, the specifics, especially Alan Wolke. Uh, one of these days I'll get a chance to meet him. We converse every once in a while, uh, but uh, he's a great guy to uh, to help out with the scopes and uh, the, the videos are real down to earth, real easy to understand. And uh, like I say, he, he does a great job and you just salivate over the gear he's got in his home lab. Of course, working for Tektronix, I, would, I can see that. This is, Vic, uh, this is Victor, K1VEA. How you doing, Victor? Hi, question. Did, you, you saw, saw some information there about the different kits coming in from China. Is there anything out there that replicates the uh, what Heathkit used to make for the shack? Is there any current generation of something that would be easily modified uh, to do what Heathkit used to do with that, that just, uh, shack scope? Yeah, with the station monitor, you can do that with any oscilloscope. Uh, again, if you go back to Alan's YouTubes, uh, he, he, has a, he has a circuit to build that will uh, sample the RF and get the demodulated signal so you can look at that <laughs> trapezoid. Uh, they're real easy circuits. They're a piece of cake to build. And then you can use it with any oscilloscope. So what would you, if you, had, if you were going to get something from China, if you will, what would you say to Mark? Well, I've got, I've, I've got a Rigol scope. And uh, I like it a lot. It's well made. Uh, you know, it's a pretty nice scope. Uh, the other good company is Siglent. Uh, there right now are some real deals out there. You're seeing a uh, hundred megahertz uh, two channel <laughs> scope for $200 uh, from Owan. Uh, there's, you know, the China stuff yeah, I hate to admit it, but if they're applying these lessons to their military, we got to be careful. Uh, I mean, they're do they're doing some really great jobs with the stuff. And as a matter of fact, even uh, uh, even these higher end scopes are are being manufactured in China. So uh, you want to be you know any any most any decent scope. Look for plenty of bandwidth. Look for plenty of memory. Look for a lot of samples per second. Uh, that's a that's a big important specification if you're going to go with a digital scope. What kind of magnitude is samples per second? Uh, you probably want to get at least a gig. Uh, two gig is better, you know. And once you start getting up above uh, three or four hundred megahertz of bandwidth, you still want to go even higher uh, when you can find them. But once you get to that level of digital scope, uh, you're in the multi thousand dollar area. Ah. Uh. So if you're, if you're just looking for a shack monitor, then probably an analog scope is your best bet. Okay. Which you probably you. have to find on the used market. And the thing that I found is you have to be careful on the, the specifications because you can have a scope, a two channel scope with two giga samples per second. And guess what? That's only if you use one probe. If you okay. use two channels, it drops it down to one each. Right, and then you, you want to be sure you got enough memory backing it up too. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of a uh, lot of a lot of spec uh, specmanship going going on with the way they document some of that stuff. Yeah. So, what was um, uh, Alan's YouTube channel? Uh, Alan W two A E W. Just search for that on YouTube, and uh, be prepared to be amazed. <laughs> okay, I see his channel. Uh, Paul, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. Jim Wilbur, AB1WQ. Um, you, uh, some of these digital scopes have uh, math functions uh, where you can uh, get a a, uh, a plus B or A minus B. How effective yeah. is, say, an A minus B math function uh, to, to get like a differential, equivalent differential input uh, if you don't have an isolated input? Yeah, it, it will do that. If you're, if you're doing DC, for example, which of course you probably use a meter for anyway, uh, mm -hmm. but remember it, that A, A my, uh, yeah, B minus A or A minus B uh, function is gonna give you a trace. Doesn't right. give you a digital readout, it gives you a trace 
of what you're looking at. So if you're looking at a varying signal, your trace is going to show you a varying signal as well. What's the bandwidth of that of that math function? Is that computed or is it done electrically? The, the real difference between that and a differential probe is the common mode range. The common mode range when you use two channels plus math is limited to the single channel common mode, mm -hmm. which is just the scope's input range. If you have a differential probe, typically they can have a much larger common mode offset. Wait, answer your question? Well, uh, assuming you don't have an extreme common mode requirement there, um, is the is the bandwidth of the, again, of the math function equal to the bandwidth of the A or B channel? Yep, You're, for sure. Yeah? Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Anything else? All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We really Thank appreciate you, it. Great job. Thank you. Thank Thank you, you all. Very freezing. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Take care. Thank you, Paul. All right. I've got I've got another one coming up on uh, on multimeters. Hopefully by the end of December or so. All right. All right. See you later, guys. I'm going to get out of here. Okay. okay. All right. Bye -bye. Bye. Thanks again. Good night. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll Thank see you, you next yeah. month.